Yeah. Okay, let me see. Okay, watch it on we watch the video on YouTube. So it's a great honor to have Dr. Yun Chun Mo from KAIST. Uh, his research is basically in the over uh, overlapping area of computer science, management, sociology, operations research, command and control analysis, healthcare analysis, disaster management. And he is now a associate professor at KAIST and he received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Today we'll be talking about computational social science with latent information. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Moon, and uh, I'm going to talk about the computational social science with latent information. Uh, and uh, before my presentation, I really appreciate uh, for you to having me here. So this is my name, and the okay. So I. Have I finished my PhD in 2008? Uh, in uh, actually, at that time it was different uh, department name, but now they changed it to the societal computing. So this is my PhD area. And after that, um, I have been branching out to the modeling and simulation work and the artificial intelligence work. And I'm gonna uh, talk about how I uh, kind of navigated through these kind of areas to find some common. Uh, from, uh, fundamentals. So a short uh, introduction of my work. So I do some modeling and simulation and I do some artificial intelligence and particularly these two diagrams uh, some of you may notice that these are called uh, plane notations which are uh, kind of representation diagram for the probabilistic graphical model uh, which I'm going to talk about. Okay so these are about me short introduction and the uh, motivations of my research. So um, when I fish, finished my PhD, like as in my doctoral thesis, uh, what I did is fundamentally modeling society and groups. So it can be a very broad concept, so I have to limit myself to a certain domain, such as uh, military and terrorism uh, at that time. So I finished my uh, PhD in 2008 and so started, started from 2004. So so there was uh, such kind of research questions, and after that, uh, I went to I went back to Korea and uh, have been there at KAIST, uh, and uh, I had to kind of expand it, uh, my research domains uh, in terms of the applications to the other areas. So while I'm doing that, um, still my fundamental question is how to model and uh, how to model group, and in modeling them the individuals really matter. So from the modernist perspective, what you want to do is the estimate the individual's behavior, and ultimately, the estimating the behavior as a collective. So individual's behavior uh, and the sum of them is not the same as the a collective's behavior because there are interactions and synergies and conflicts. So uh, we want to do kind of what the story will uh, uh, fold out uh, when we do a individual modeling and we want to see that uh, as a collective uh, result. So uh, to, to do so we have to find some uh, really general models for these individuals and their macro kind of systemic changes of time. Uh, at the time even though it looked like a real world map which is a really real world map and we use name, realistic names. However, um, still the questions remain. And I think that there are many agent-based models out there uh, still doing, uh, uh, still doing a very nice job. Uh, however, still we have to ask questions. So sometimes, many times it's been rule-based and it is very hardly been validated. For the depends, there are not enough data sets and um, and also, it's really not clear how to validate given a kind of non-matchable um, data set. So it's very hard to be validated. And so, and also, it's very conceptual model because that we cannot model every nitty-gritty details in our model. So it, it can be conceptual at a certain resolution level. And why we did that for the quadratic analysis? So we understand that it is rule-based uh, and 
we assume their behaviors and the, our data, our data sets are not complete. However, we want to uh, kind of want to analyze their behaviors as an individual and collective to recommend something to analyze like their long-term changes, even though we do not have that at the moment. So that's for the quality analysis. But problem. So while we are doing that, uh, there were kind of uh, lingering research questions, right? So first, we have to model individuals. And that modeling individuals require domain knowledge. So the experts have a lot of saying about how to model, how not to model, and these behaviors. And after that, we are assuming a certain event, and we want to see their latent dynamics, which simulations generate over time. And for example, if this is a social media system, then there are individuals, and there might be someone who have a different uh, behavior rules or kind of policy. Then we want to see how this person's involvement in the exchange of thoughts and the changing evolution of topics and so forth. So, problem is how to understand the individuals and model the individuals. And the relating to that, we want to model and understand the groups and societies given these interactions. The missing link is this. So, however, this is kind of observable. Observable. And this is kind of being generated, right? Being generated. And we are assuming this, assuming this, some, some of the individual rules. And these are kind of our belief. Given a certain set of conditions and rules, then our belief that Mm, it's going to play out this way. After gathering, we were able to gather more data sets and in terms of the large quantity, um, we, what we, what we want to do is that we want to perform an inference, right? guessing, inference task. Right? So given these observations, given these observations, we want to guess how this play out rather than generating this. So, it's kind of cycle of the generation and inference, generation inference. Right? So given these data sets, I want to uh, do a modeling individuals and their collective uh, movements uh, with support of the data sets. So I started uh, branching out or like kind of going uh, in depth to kind of uh, generation uh, in in inference and generation cycles of the social system model. So having said that, uh, we, has, uh, we had uh, a, this line of thoughts from the early 2000s, like around the two, really 2000 and 2001, 2003. At that time, uh, one kind of one trend at the time was finding some complexity, uh, complexities and emergent behaviors, phenomena, and also people called scale-free networks and the low growth plots and deep distribution, this kind of complex um, uh, complexities were kind of introduced and people were really excited to finding out in these phenomena. And that were kind of data driven and the analyzer uh, have been found from the analyzing large quantity of data sets. After the, that early 2000, around 2002, 2003, 2004, people started building a further comp uh, comp Right, complex models, very right, sophisticated models to analyze these kind of big data sets. So people uh, have been developing like progressive model like the LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation models, and so forth. And after like 2010, around 2008, 9, 10-ish, um, people found a nice uh, inventions and they made a technical breakthroughs in the neural network. So it joined to this uh, progressive modeling uh, uh, methodologies. So these days we call it deep generative models. So it, it uses deep neural networks, but still it's kind of generative model. So there was a continuing ideas of this kind of how to use data, how to collect, use the data sets, how to model the data sets, and how to model that data sets and further. So uh, given this line of uh, my motivation, generation and inference, and the uh, development of the uh, of the methodologies. Uh, 
Uh, I have been doing, yeah. So what kind of inference, what, 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 what are you trying to infer? So you have, you have agent-based model with individual rules assigned to agents, and then you have outputs of the agent-based models, yeah. which is your evolving patterns. Yeah, and, and I would like to stop, that, stop you there because I don't use agent-based model. I'm not going to talk about agent-based models ex except one slide throughout this talk. So uh, I kind of left this agent-based models, at least for this talk, okay? So that's what I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to talk about, what I'm going to infer in the agent-based models. Rather, I'm going to infer the generation process, the parameters for the generation process of the social phenomena, okay? So, for example, here we have R5 beta, right? And these are, if you are familiar with the Bayesian network, these are the random variables, right? And these random variables are random variable Y. It has a random distribution, right? Probability distribution. And that distribution requires what? The parameters. And the parameters are the target that we are going to infer. Okay? So, hyperparameters of the. Hmm? Hyperparameters. Hyperparameters and the latent variables also has a probability, probability distribution, right? And yeah. that will have the parameter as well. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to infer. And these yeah. parameters will tell us the latent information of the targets of the individuals and the societies at the scale. So what I'm missing is the link between you call it complex networks, I call it ABM. So link between complex networks and statistical model. Okay, so what I'm going to say is that, for example, if this is an agent-based model, have you ever uh, heard the name of the title of the book, Generative Social Science? No. Okay, so there is that kind of book, and it talks about the agent-based model. But it says it's a generative model. Why is that? Why is generative model? Because we give a certain policy and rules and individuals, and we don't specify the play out, the scenarios all along. Mm -hmm. And it are, that simulator is going to generate that uh, the path of the timeline, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the generation, right? And what's the generation here? If you, are you familiar with Bayesian network? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Then you know that we have to specify generative process mm -hmm. whenever we write the probability graphical model. Then you, then there is gen generative process, right? Okay. Yeah. So both so, of them are gener gener generative models. So mm -hmm. that's both of them are generative yeah, models. Both are the generative models, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the reason why I didn't uh, gave you the uh, image network, for example, because it's not a generative model, right? It's this discriminant. Rather, this is a generative model. Why is that? Because it has an encoder-decoder structure, right? And decoder structure does what? Reconstruction. Oh, In so other words, it's generation. Z is, Z is random there, right? Yeah. Right. Good. So I'm going to talk about a little bit um, uh, the two couple of case studies that I did for this kind of digital models and the uh, latent uh, variable models. Okay, so this was published in uh, 2008, AAAI. So, um, so still, I'm, uh, my main research thrust is modeling individuals and society and groups, right? So I did not uh, lack that kind of application domains or uh, interest on the people and society. So I found myself uh, being interested in the, this kind of political science. So God checks us and I think that George Mason is a good place to talk about politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there, there are these kind of data sets and uh, talking about the politician, the that, and things like that. And the data set that I, I was interested in was the local data set. So I don't, and for me, I, I don't know really details of these bills and it's, it's, they are very complex and the, uh, I might guess what it means, but it has many particular backgrounds. So, I would not dare to interpret this. Having said that, uh, still what I can see is the text data sets that for each bill we have text. And for each bills, we know that a certain person voted yay and nay and so forth. And these are being called local data sets. And these are the specification of that. 
Uh, this is not, uh, so I, I'm going to talk about many of my work uh, today, but the, this is not my work. This is uh, something uh, done by uh, Professor David uh, Bly, and the, he did this research uh, saying that we can find the ideal point estimation. Okay, so ideal means, here ideal means ideology, okay, ideological point estimation. So we are not going to say a semantic, we are, we are not going to put a semantics on this, right? So I'm inten intentionally saying the left side and the right side. I'm not saying left wing or right wing because that I didn't put any semantics on it. Having said that, the, this person and this person had differences in this kind of ideological point estimation results, right? So actually, the, when, when we say that there is a line here, and extreme and extreme, and can uh, assign individuals on this continuum, uh, actually, it's not the first work. Actually, the first work uh, came from the 85, uh, coming, coming from the political science, someone who knew the mathematics and the statistics. So at the time, the uh, it was a single dimensional ideological point estimation. However, it can be very multiple dimensions. So in the depends, um, I'm kind of hard right wing and the, in the social welfare can be left wing and the other areas I can be any type I want, right? So uh, really people are in that diverse in their interest. So, peop, uh, so there, was, uh, there were researches on the higher dimensional either, either point estimations. You can see that early 85, there were models, but after 2000 and the, after 2004, so collecting the data sets and analyzing the data sets with more sophisticated probability models, uh, this kind of research has grown. Uh, 2004 and two, uh, 2012 and 2014, so these are kind of uh, a development of sorts. And I wanted to do further on this. So these are set up of my research questions. So the, for each view and legislators, uh, can we identify, quantify the ideal point estimation? Okay. And the, after that, it's actually, I would dare to say trust, I would multiply this as like alignment, alignment of behavior of two politicians, let's say. And can you quantify that? And can we model the behavior of the individual legislators and taking into their ideas and the alignment and kind of voting predictions? That's very quantitative and things like that. So we want to answer these kind of research one, two, three, and four with latent value models designed as a um, probabilistic graphical model, taking into uh, taking uh, some uh, implementation of the deep geometry model. So this is more like kind of BG paper. I just wanted to show you the how overall, overall flow uh, happens. So this is a data set. And given this data set, I, I ask research question one, two, three, four with a model, graphical model. And then I get the latent information so that I can answer some of these research questions. Particularly, uh, I'm going to model this model is going to be two parts, contents parts and network parts. So contents part is whether a legislator will vote yay or nay given a text. Given a text, we can see that how the text context is kind of uh, measured in terms of the bills, uh, ideal point estimation, ideal point, and then how well matched. So if it's well matched, then that person will say yeah yay, or otherwise say nay. That's the content part. Other part is, the other part is network part. So I'm not going to look at the text, build text. I'm rather asking my friends and how they will respond to these bots, and I'm going to align myself to that behavior, that kind of thing. So naturally, this content part will, uh, will have a certain weighting, and so does uh, this network part, so I say alpha as waiting for the contents part and beta as waiting for the network part. I'm going to explain the details of the variables later. So, uh, to, so to model this kind of situations, I suggest two models. So one is NIPEN VAE and the other is NIPEN tensor. 
So NIPAN means I, I, I just put my uh, put a name here, a neural ideal point estimation network. And this dash represents the uh, the variations of this NIPAN model. So I use variation autoencoder for this part and tensor factorization for this part. Okay? So this is more like a neural network only model, neural ne serious neural network models, and uh, with a little bit of uh, removing the taste of the graphical models. And this is more like a graphical model taking the neural network part in it. Okay, before I go further, I will just give you a little bit of background of the variation autoencoder, or ladder autoencoders. So I would say that, so if someone's are here, and their behaviors are here, then we can actually factorize that into two matrices and connecting dimension, hidden dimensions that we call latents. Okay, latents and latents. Given these multiplications of the latents and latents, we get another regenerated matrix again, which can be a similar like this, but of course it has some different parts because that we are kind of going through a latent parts to regenerate this. So what's what's your M's and N's? Okay, so M's here are the bills, for example, and N's are the restorators. Okay? It can be any types of models. For example, the users and music, and whether they choose it or not to play out. Okay? And watchers and movies, Netflix questions. Okay? And the legislators and the bills, whether they yay or nay. Okay, good. And so we go, we get a latency here, right? Uh, so actually, this has been done as this kind of graphical process, graphical model. It is being called actual matrix factorization. And in the autoencoder setting or encoder decoder structure of the neural network, uh, it has an encoder part like this and decoder part like this. And if it matches up, then we can say auto encoder. If it doesn't match up, then it's encoder decoder structure, right? Okay, I'm going to go further into this uh, deep geometry models or like uh, uh, graphical models with deep geometry model. So here, I'm going to say that this is a, this W will represent text parts and the text parts will result in some topics, and that topics will uh, estimate the latent of the bill. Okay? So this says, this latent of bill says that this bill is about the small businesses, this bill is about the defense, this bill is about the, some international relations and sports. So this, these are rather, we can say, topics. On the other hand, we have a bill either point. Okay? Um, so why I have latent of bill and bill ideal points? So for example, international relations, let's say international relations, and it can be a left-wing issue or right-wing issues, for example. So it has, they have their differences. Or for example, the small businesses. No one will argue we have to support small businesses. However, there are differences in how to part, okay? Then that, that means that the topics can be part neutral. Rather, approaches can be a party influenced. So I say bill has its ideal points separated with this bill's latent. So we have topics and the uh, the uh, ideal point estimations. Okay. So that's the bill part. So this big box represents the bill. And these arrows, if you are not familiar with the Bayesian networks, this says uh, generation, 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 generation. So generation will influence how that. A uh, random variable uh, will be sampled and all generated. Okay, so this latent of bill and bill's ideal point together influence the R I R U D, which is the uh, where is that uh, uh, voting result? <coughs> yeah, here it is, voting result. And so, but that's also being influenced by what? The regist registrator's either points. Okay. Registrator's and that registrator's either point, of course, it will influence the voting results. However, we want to do further was, what we want to do further was uh, kind of uh, imagining the network structures uh, between the registrators. 
So here we have a hierarchical structure, U as a legislators, and U prime is another set of legislators. So tau U U becomes what the adjacent matrix. So it's a low material for the social network creation. So we have the legislators networks, their alignment, and legislators are either point estimations that governs the network part inference. And also this is this governs views either point estimation part. Together we create, we generate the voting. And however, as I said earlier, and as questions, so voting is the something that we uh, analyze. We, we can observe, right? So what we infer? We are going to infer alpha and beta strengths and tau and the various ratings and the various size. Right. So these are the something that we discuss with the subject matter experts. And so is this it are, are the factors are there and their causalities are there? Is it okay to model like this? I can ask questions to the subject matter experts and also I have some knowledge on this, uh, whether it is appropriate appropriate uh, designs or not, and how to separate the returns and so forth. And after that discussion when you have this appropriate graphical model designed, then what I can do is that turn this uh, design into a likelihood functions. Okay? So uh, if you are familiar with the Bayesian network, then you know that evidence low bound, right? So this part, this variation autoencoder part, will require evidence lower bound, uh, which is here, number one, and these two and three are the factors actually this works like a switching mechanism so R if rud is one that becomes one and zero otherwise if it is zero uh, minus one and uh, minus one this becomes activated this in dj okay so two three together will model the voting records so here we have a probability of voting being yay or nay and that is being modeled like this. So here we say alpha, alpha, beta, beta. Here, alpha is the strength of these alignments. These alignments here means that x as restorators either point estimation, y as bills ratings, and the a as bills either point. So given this ratings, given this topic of the bill, restorators either point and various ideal point being aligned, being aligned, and given this latent strength, then that probability will go up as scaled like alpha. Okay. For the beta part, we have tau and the tau, uh, tau weighted R, the friends voting records, and being weighted by beta here. So it, it makes the uh, network parts influence. So content parts and network parts together makes the voting probability and that becomes two and three. And four, actually um, these are not common to uh, the graphical models. Uh, there are a set of things that you are going to regularize to control the uh, kind of remove the sensitivity of the latent variable inf uh, inference. Uh, however, this four is uh, kind of uh, a context situated or like situated or this uh, application oriented regularization. So here Y and G, Y and G are being regulated. Why? Because that this Y is more being inferred by the voting records and this G is more import, inferred by the words and we are going to limit the their changes, like their deviations. So we have that regularization. Okay, so rather drawing this is one thing, but adding this kind of control mechanism is another technical stuff. And this five is a, a normal regularization uh, to avoid uh, overfitting the variables to the data sets. Before okay. you go away from that, could you talk a little bit more about the yellow part, the legislator network strength? Okay. Because there is not one to one, mm -hmm. you have a network, yeah. but not all legislators mm -hmm. are created equal with respect to the power that mm -hmm. they have. 
there's party affiliation, there are whips, there are uh, Speaker of the House. And yeah, all. yeah. How, how do you bring that in? Uh, so that's a good part, uh, that's good, very good question. Uh, and actually, that's the kind of weak points of this model. Uh, why is that? Because it does not distinguish one legislator to another. So everyone are being treated equal, which in reality is not. Uh, they have their seniorities, they have their positions. But in terms of the network, uh, the influence part, every U and U prime are treated being equal. So there is no prior belief on this tau U, U prime. So it is very good idea or it is it's going to be a very good uh, uh, like uh, improvement if we can add like prior structure for individuals uh, uh, positions and attributes and so forth as a prior. Uh, if you want to do that, then you are going to create another random variable here and make it the arrow here. Okay. Yeah. Good. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk uh, talk real detail about this like this. Uh, so here we have for the probability here x, y, a we have this. x, y, a we have this. And it is a three way, three dimensions. So we have three way tensor here, three dimensional tensor here. And we can apply the tensor, actually tensor factorization, which is kind of a new development in the era of the neural network. We can use that. Um, so after uh, uh, introducing the model, we can introduce the data set that we use. So actually, there is a benchmark data set created by David Bly, uh, Paratik uh, 2013. And so we use that. And also, uh, in our laboratory, our laboratory expanded that data set by adding three more data sets, uh, three more years. So we created projects uh, 2016, like this. And this is the result, uh, interesting part. So this is something why I wanted to do a latent variable model, so that we can profile uh, bills and legislative partitions and their ideal, ideal values. So for example, like this. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 uh, topics, which is coming from ultimately G, like inferred from the world distribution of each of the bills and the, uh, we found 10 topics. And we went through, actually it's a list of uh, words, but we were able to put a label in it, on it. So we say foreign or agriculture and so forth. So given this uh, set of the uh, dimensions, we can say that given this, if we limit ourselves to analyze this bill, then we can say that, okay, this is about the business and finance this much, and defense this much. It's not that much related to the agriculture, but also related to the international trade, and things like that, and so related to disaster management. Yeah. So we have this kind of bills profile, and for the ideological parts here, uh, business and finance is kind of, I'm not, I'm not saying the left or right wing, but rather say that to the minus points, very much uh, kind of a hard line. Ha however, for the other uh, areas of the uh, latent topics is kind of being party neutral, uh, close to the zero. Okay? So we can see that uh, which particular parties would prefer this bill or not. So that's the bill ideal point estimation part. So these are all the latent variables. Okay? These are all the latent variable uh, parameters. And these are the ideal point estimation. Okay? So same latent dimensions, we put each of these individuals as dots. Okay? So we have like hundreds of resurators here. And each of these dots represent the ideological point estimation for each uh, perspective. Okay. Uh, uh, given that, so for example, disaster management, it can, disaster management should be done, right? It's very party neutral, so it's kind of very similar. However, business and finance, the two parties have really different view. And uh, where is the further? So, ah, 
And the, uh, something interesting for me is that uh, healthcare is a little different between the two parties. However, social welfare is quite similar. So they have similar social welfare, but not the healthcare system. Okay, so we can see that each of each of individuals' ideological um, where they stand in terms of these topics. Who are the extreme? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the outliers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we can name this, but you know what? For me, it's alien's name, <laughs> so I don't know for sure. But um, some words that stands out is the lompo and the. I don't. I, I do not remember these okay. names. Okay. But but we can find the names yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, I believe that he is. Is it right? Uh, is he kind of extreme right wing person? No. Hard right. Hard right Republican person. That long for, long for. He's more of a libertarian than a hard right. He's okay. very. He's very tricky. Okay, 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 all right. So from our numbers that his names comes up. <coughs> so anyhow, so this was the Tau U and U prime, Tau U U prime network, okay? So similarities between any two or any pair of the individuals. Okay. So if it comes to the red, then they are very aligned. So someone bought in this way and we can surely predict the other person will predict a similar way. And this, um, the dark blue represents the other way. If this person vote in this way, in this uh, uh, alignment, then the other person will vote in the opposite directions. So we can infer that kind of, uh, the, it's actually not the social network, it's rather continuum of the adjacent matrix, but it's a raw material for the social network creations. And what we can do further is that we can discrete, discretize it and really apply the social network conventional tools like these centralities and so forth. And uh, that's what we did. And uh, we modeled alpha and beta. Alpha is more content driven and beta is more like network driven persons. So here, content based person. Okay? These are the really someone who reads the bill and bought by the bill contents. Okay? They read and they respond for the text, for the text. And these are the people who um, who really, I would say, that align well with the colleagues. Right? So they rather, rather explaining their behaviors based upon text, it, it will be much better to explain or predict their behaviors based upon their friend's behavior. So that's the content and network part. Okay. Uh, well, I put names here. I do not know for sure whether it's being true or not, but I, I can assure you that the numbers are coming through, but interpretations are up to kind of leaders. And finally, uh, so these are the latent models. Latent, latent information can tell you many things about individuals and how the system works. Um, but the, we do not know for sure whether these latents are giving us the right information. So one way to check it is that, okay, so given this latent information, why don't you predict their uh, voting record? And that is this part, and we are kind of doing good uh, in terms of the prediction. So that uh, given that we are assuming that our latent uh, information are valuable in the predictions, I'm not kind of saying that it's true, but valuable for predicting their behavior. Okay, um, so what time is it? Uh, 40? Oh, okay, yeah, so uh, five, five minutes or 10 minutes. So I'm gonna be very quick uh, for the case study too. Okay, so we were doing kind of Q&A, so it took kind of a little bit longer, yeah. So, uh, I have this kind of political analysis. I have another part of healthcare analysis. However, the story is, is quite same. I'm going to be a little bit quicker for this time. So in their do domain, same thing, patient and diagnosis. We just call it latent people. And in their healthcare domain, they call it phenotype. 
So they have phenotype and genotype, and they call it phenotype in terms of the exponential I express the rate. And actually, this phenotype we imagine that can be used in many different ways. So patients, phenotype, and like, or maybe we can call it soft cluster to the time, their ages, and patients, phenotype, and their diagnosis, patient, phenotype, and medication. So the one cluster finding can be applied to their to some uh, temporal uh, pattern related to the diagnosis pattern and related to the medication pattern. So what I'm trying to say is that patients has a certain clusters, a assignment to a certain cluster, soft cluster, and that cluster will say that that cluster is often found in a certain kind of timeline in their life and they are likely to show this diagnosis and they are likely to have received these medications. Okay. So, so time is just one, two, three it's a sequence of time steps. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. So these now uh, I'm going to be so overview and here this is a typical structure, right? So this pi is the phenotype, okay? That influences a metric spectralization here and metric spectralization here. That is the medication part of the metric spectralization. And phenotype here and diagnosis here. So it's diagnosis uh, metric spectralization. And here we do a little bit of medical school risk uh, assessment like this. And we correlate it to that, to the demographics. Okay. So actually it's the same, uh, uh, the Bayesian network that I showed you earlier. But the earlier work, earlier presentation was actually done later than this work. So this is work of 2016 and the prior uh, uh, kind of uh, the session was about the, on the, was done in 2018. So uh, that time uh, we didn't use the uh, neural network parts. However, these are, as you can see here, as an infinite indication is a Bayesian non-parametric model so that we don't have to specify the number of copies here. So at that time, we didn't use neural networks, so graduate students had to come up with these kind of data metrics, update formulas for the latent variables. So we used a certain data sets, and actually these are the things that we can find. So given no label of the demographics, given label of the demographics 65 to 75, 75 to 85, 85 to above, and given the label of the male or female, and actually what you can do is the label of male 85 above or female 75 to 85. Anyway, given these conditions, demographic backgrounds, what you can find is that likelihoods of belonging to a certain phenotype and that the diagnosis that phenotype is likely uh, has and the medication that likely to receive. So, that's a good information for the like, like healthcare administrations. Okay, so after that, kind of this, this is more like the mass population profiling, uh, profiling for the diagnosis and the uh, medications and their demographics. Uh, for each individual, we do some future diagnosis predictions. This is another different set of research. So, thi so this work was done, uh, published in the Ichikai 2016, and the, this work was done for the ICDM last year, 2018. And that time, then we used recurrent neural networks. So it's very much individual prediction model. So, kind of, we wanted to develop further from the mass population to the individual prediction models. However, what they found out is that we can improve the prediction of the sequence by utilizing demographic uh, latents, put it in the, this kind of attention model, rather in, uh, in, uh, uh, by joining this uh, demographic, demographic latents with the sequential latents. So this YT is the uh, estimation target and here comes in one set of the information that we found earlier in the kind of kind of work that uh, that we did in 2016, latents of the from the demographics and individuals. 
So I'm gonna go further. Um, so actually that helps the influence of the predictions. I want to just mention that, okay, so this is an in general uh, attention model that you can use for the natural language and like movie, pre movie recommendation. However, this kind of in general attention models will focus on the less time if it is being used without context. Because the less time information will be the most important information to predict the next. However, this is our kind of set of models. So these are the timelines. When it comes to the last part of it, then it is being used for the next time steps, um, the prediction. However, unlike this, then we go back to one person's like history, the old old histories, to look for the information or supports for the uh, predictions of the next next time step. Okay, so for each of these latent uh, variables, uh, it is high dimensional, so that you can kind of compress it to the two dimensional. So. Uh, that technique is called being called TSNE, and this is one set of TSNE view. Uh, to some people, it means something. To some people, it's nice visualization. Okay. So that was the two case studies that I wanted to show you. Actually, the both works are about the generation and inference. So we have individuals model how they behave and generate the observations. Okay, and previously when I was a PhD student, I used agent-based models to generate this kind of latent or like kind of development of the samples of the of the information. And and the commonality is that still I want to uh, look at this kind of playout going through the timelines. However, that should be further supported by the data sets by doing more like statistical inference. And that is the part that I showed you. Okay, so these are just now going to be a little sampler of this, um, of the other works that I do. So because I use these kind of deep generative models for this generation, so co cause and effect, quality, generation, and dotted line inference, okay? so. Because I use this kind of structure, I have to do some kind of work on the variation autoencoder. So I do some research on the fundamental questions of the how we structure variation autoencoders given a certain context. And how to, like this is about more like kind of uh, the performance part, like whether we can use the GAN structures or like the uh, ladder structures and things like that. Uh, and this is like uh, trying to find out the structures of the latent space. Okay, so VAE does dot dots, and what I want to do is that whether we can create a tree on top of the latent, so that we can really dissect the areas and find the meanings. And I'm more like doing a like, situated. Uh, kind of applications or context-aware applications of these neural networks. So LSTM, there is LSTM. It is good for RNN task. However, the better, we can do better by adding some context in it of the task. So that's the things that I do. And so today, besides of the motivation parts, I didn't talk about the agent-based models. Uh, actually, that's true that um, recent years that I didn't do much about on the agent-based works. However, uh, I feel kind of responsible for doing further on the agent-based model because that I like that field, and also I think that that fields can do better with kind of this kind of data inferences and database statistical inferences and so forth. So, uh, what I'm doing these days is this. So rather explaining these complex diagrams, this is something that I can explain. So blue lines is the, uh, the simulation result. It has confidence interval because that is Monte Carlo run. So confidence interval and simulation result mean, mean line. And these reds are the 
single time observation though coming from the real world. Okay? First time it matches up. Beyond these time steps, the model deviates from the real world. So up to a certain point, it works well. The other parts, hard to tell. But uh, what I'm trying to do with MLM-supported ABM cal calibra uh, calibration actually works well to a certain point, and now it starts to deviate. Then I calculate the latency of the agent states and the, some of the temporal dynamic uh, temporal parameters of the agent-based models and recalibrate it based upon the, these latency to match up with the real world. And so that it comes down. When it comes down, mm -hmm. when it starts to deviate, try to recalibrate, but at the but this example was not able to calibrate. However, when calibration is successful, then goes up together. So it is, this is something that I do uh, uh, for ABM community these days, like ML-based ABM calibration, so that uh, we, uh, ABM can be further useful uh, in kind of calibrate, uh, with support of the calibration and validation. Okay, lessons learned. So uh, no standing technical trend, so the so big data and the uh, progressive graphical models and neural networks, these are the terms that we learn, and there will be new terms next year in the next de decade, so these are the tools, like, but I think that we have to set up a kind of big flow of thoughts uh, that what we are interested in, and my keywords are the understanding humans, understanding individuals, and how their collection of humans are behaving in such a way when it comes to the society groups, and I use these kind of different technologies for that uh, purpose, and that purpose uh, I found that these days very interesting that generation and inference cycles by utilizing that models, descriptive models, and the statistical inference coming from with the uh, descriptive models. Okay. So that's what I kind of work on. And that's what I have for now. Uh, and uh, and 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 what time is it? Uh, eight more minutes. Eight. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So actually, the uh, there is an expense that I have to pay for travel like this, and my institution requests me to introduce some of my <laughs> <laughs> institutions. So I have to do this. So bear with me, like it's a stage pitch for five minutes. Uh, so short introduction to KAIST. Actually, the KAIST was established in 1971, and it has more than 50 years of the of a history, and actually, you know what? I I'm I'm very glad to say that I came here Washington D.C. to um, to KAIST because that KAIST was uh, established by the USAID. So so you did very good job, uh, and we are very grateful for that. Um, and said that the the we are progressing, and the the numbers are really not uh, something that we can believe, but we are doing fine and the very competitive in the regionally and so forth. And my department has around 20 uh, professors. So uh, in many different parts of the disciplines. So ISCUR, even though we have, I, we are the ISC departments and they are just half. And one of uh, these I have like a share here, computer science, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and electrical engineering. So it's very diverse uh, community, and the and we work with the uh, USC, Peking, and Technion, and so forth. And actually, yesterday I was at uh, I was in Toronto uh, to do the similar talk like this, and the, we are going to have a kind of uh, working relationship with Toronto. There they have mechanical and industrial engineering. So. Uh, and I'm kind of uh, in this branch, and data science of the intelligence system. Okay. My laboratory, finally. <laughs> I, we have like around 19 people. Right. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. And if you have any questions, then I can answer. Yeah.
I have two comments, two questions. Yeah. One is a comment and one is a question. Thank you. On the one that you showed that uh, it is not tracking very well in the ABM model and so forth, there, would it make, it, it appears that it cannot predict the change so that you can recalibrate. Would it make sense to computing on the side, anticipating change, and be ready to change much faster than waiting until you are sure a change has taken? To yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very actually this is a very common problem. Can be a common problem in the controls, right? The, no, yeah, but you have to have an anticipatory part in it on yeah. the side because of the speed required. Yeah. The I don't have so I think that my model is very much uh, kind of refrained to response model, so it has its prediction part in it. So this this part is prediction like prediction here naturally actually this prediction should be like lower, but it's somehow spiking here. So my predictive power is imposing me to like hindering the calibration. Having said that, it is whether we are fine with this uh, to match up with this kind of sudden changes. Because obviously, if we give this only the red lines, people might say that okay, this is something like this, but this was a certain event. Okay, so it will be good to have a certain lever or parameter or like kind of something that we can control on it, whether we decide with that control, whether we decide match this, whatever. Or, okay, this looks like fine, this is too much to uh, calibrate. That kind of, that if we have a certain parameter in that continuum, that will be good. Um, still premature, I haven't done it yet, but it will be good at. Okay. And the second is a comment really about all your work with voting. Have you thought of sending a letter to Prime Minister Theresa May in UK and offering your services <laughs> about Brexit? <laughs> voting records? Uh, for voting predictions. Uh, actually, we, uh, you know how that, actually I want to tell that uh, the Professor Levis was in my physics committee and when I was uh, doing the, some human modeling, and uh, it's a long way from modeling part to the real world part. It's, it's a last mile problem. It costs most, even though it's the last mile. Like hundreds of miles of logistics cost like penny, and last mile it costs dollar. So I wouldn't dare to send a letter to prime ministers or the presidents that I can do this. Rather, I would send my papers to the conferences. <laughs> 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 so it looks like it's just your model is inadequate here, right? Mm, uh, it, it cannot capture the sudden shift, right? There is not enough of capacity in the model to capture uh, Yes and no. Yes and no. Because, um, do, can we say this is sudden? Why we say this is sudden? Oh, there probably was some event that the model does not know how to, yeah. to yeah. capture. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, so, here, it were able to capture like this, initially, right? Then it can capture like this, right? So from the temporal perspective, uh, it might not be a sudden change, right? However, if there is a bias, so if it is a bias, then if it is forcing a certain direction, it may be biased not to calibrate on this. Of course, the bias can be a good thing to remove the overfitting, or can be a bad thing because it removed the true parameters. Yeah. Uh, parameters. And that was, I think, that Professor Levis uh, commented on. And he said that the, there will be two sources. So this, even though ML-based many runs of like, big data calibration, we will never recover these deadlines. Two reasons. One reason is incompleteness of the model. Okay. Our agent-based model is incomplete, and it, ha it does not have enough kind of capability of matching the real world. And second one, incompleteness of the real world. 
Okay? So our observations may be incorrect, uh, may be incorrect, okay? This is a single, single observation. Our real world is a single observation of the Monte Carlo runs. So matching up might not be a good idea to that. So two different sources of the problem. And how do, how do you solve calibration problems? So you have this agent-based model, right, mm -hmm. which is a black box. Mm -hmm. So agent-based so agent model, simulation, simulated results, real-world data, simulation deviations, and this is the magic box, and yeah, do so some calibration, and newly calibrated parameters. Yeah, so that's the box game. I'm wondering about. Yeah, this one. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, have, you, uh... you will have to read my paper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, actually the, uh, I can, we are in academia, so I can explain. Uh, so the, it comes to the two different passages. One is the dynamic passage, dynamic part, temporal part. Okay, so given this emergence, that emer how this emergence is driven. One is the temporal dynamics. Okay, the society was moving in this direction, and society has inertia, and we have to model that inertia. The temporal part. And the other part, why we have we see this emergence? Because individuals are making it. We have to model the individuals. So this is the dynamic calibration part, and this is agent specific calibration okay, part. So I see now GPs and Bayesian optimization. So that's yeah. those things I was wondering. I could not yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have GPs and the variation autoencoders and neural networks and here and hit macro models. And so you use like uh, variation autoencoders for dimensionality reduction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And <coughs> how, however, the uh, so the agents so here agent, agents are agent based models agents are like can be hundreds and thousands tens of thousands and so it is ridiculous to have each agent's specific pa calibrated parameters so we segment it yeah, yeah. this set of the agents shared parameters this set of agents shared the parameters okay however the shared parameters should be important. That is being handled here. Yeah. Actually, this kind, this more, I think that this will be a good. And these days, I'm more like triple AI each kind of person, and the. I have not going to the winter for the last two years, so so I'm kind of abandoning my <laughs> base there. <laughs> but uh, but I want to do my duty as a researcher as a member of the community. So this is something that I prepared for that part. Uh, ABM meets ML and will be better kind of, uh, will be better used with the support of the data sets, matching the real world. Not entirely matching the real world though, for various reasons. Uh, but actually besides of that, this is are the simulation parts so we are going to add an addendum here, yeah, created by the ML. This is a, this will be a critical technology for. I don't like that those kind of keywords though. The digital twins, okay? When you are going to create a twin of the real world in the cyberspace, then you have to match up, right, with the models. Then the, this will be a key technology for that. And the, actually, by I published a conference paper on this. I'm preparing a journal paper. It will be soon uh, sent out. Uh, however, my patents are already registered. Yes. Okay. All right, it's about time. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my work. I have to be better by one. あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ